Alohamai Kako. We are the Osorio family and we are coming to you to this um, live broadcast of Earth Day Live from the Avava of Pololo, from the Moku of Koda, from the Ahua of Waikiki, the Bokukuni or Ahu, here in the Hawaiian Islands, Pai Aina o Hawaii. And we are here to celebrate our humanity and our connection to this land. We are here to observe the huge trauma that has occurred on this planet mostly due to the interactions of human beings. And we are doing this at a time when the interactions of human beings are being seriously curtailed by the COVID vi virus. So it's a strange moment. And the songs and the speeches and the stories that we have put together for our hour, for the next hour, are intended essentially to look to the past to the people that we have been uh, in these islands, uh, to how we are behaving now and also to the future. My name is John Osorio. I'm Heoli Osorio. I'm Duncan Osorio. Anything else before we sing this first song? Uh, no, I think we could, we could tell a little history about this, uh, this song. The song was written by Liko Martin in the 1970s, right? 70s? 60s, 70s, Late 60s, before 70s, I was born, <laughs> um, and it's a song that speaks to the growing fear of Hawaiians as um, we continue to watch our aina and our communities to be overrun by development and tourism, um, and this is something we're still struggling with today, and so we sing this song in honor of Uncle Lipo, but also in honor of Nana Kuli, um, and other places around our Pai Aina that have been threatened by development. Yeah. Not a Wind's gonna blow, so I'm gonna go down on the road again. Starting where mountains left me, I end up arriving there. Where I go.
I brought it down. So, uh, uh, we're going to do a song. I want to ask Jamaica to talk a little bit about the, the history of the moment here, disputes and controversy. Um, this is a really important part of what is actually happening in the at this point. This is a very much a, a, a today piece with thousands and thousands of Kalakamaori having expressed their opposition to the building of the 30 meter telescope near the summit of Mona Hamakea. I'll say some words about the song, but Jamaica spent several months uh, on the mountain as a kiai, as a, as a guardian of that place. And, uh, I'd like to hear a few more times. Uh, I think the important thing we can share briefly with folks who may be tuning in um, about Mauna Kea is that it's a great example that demonstrates the way that indigenous people cannot be separated from environment. Um, that these environmental issues to us are very personal and intimate issues. Um, and the movement to protect Mauna Kea um, in 2020 was not new. This was a movement that had been growing steam over you know, generations to protect this mountain. In 2020, this movement was also surrounded by other movements to protect land in Hawaii. Um, in particular, we can look at Kalailoa and those in Kahuku who stood against the wind turbines in their own communities. And these are really good examples of the way that uh, green energy policies are often pushed in on indigenous communities without much consultation and without looking at the real lived experiences of folks in those places who have been stewarding those lands for generations. And so I won't give a lot of details on the movement to protect Mauna Kea. There's a lot out there. You can research yourself. You can go to puuhulu.com to learn all about the most recent stand in 2020, or 2019 and 2020. You can also go to kahea.org to learn about the history, especially the legal history and battles to protect the mountain from this kind of development. And I hope people will go out and seek that information for themselves. But at the end of the day, the real lesson of this movement and the reason why so many people were willing to you know, put their bodies on the line in such harsh environmental conditions is because we continue to remember as indigenous people that these lands are our kōrana, they're our responsibility and our right to protect and live in relations with. And so any work we do around environmentalism is to take that part really seriously. It is no longer acceptable for us to create all kinds of innovative ideas about how we're going to save this planet if we're not also thinking about how we're going to honor ancient indigenous knowledge and people um, who have been, you know, trying to save this planet from capitalism, from overdevelopment, from colonialism um, for a generation. And, and from rampant tourism. Yeah. So the, the really wonderful thing about this song is also, it, it, it's really a love song uh, written by a classmate and a friend of mine, Carol Lapima. He wrote this song when he was still a very, very young man in his teens. And he wrote the song as a personal love song to the mountain that really rose up in the backyard of his, of his grandfather's ranch. Um, the song expresses a love for a place, for a land, for a landmark, for the deities that surround that landmark, for the you know, generations of people who went up to that mountain and, and and communed with these akua, with these gods. The beauty of this song is just really how simple it is. Do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. No? No. No, okay. 
Yeah, do the poem. Yeah. Okay. Ask me about the Mauna, and I will tell you about 30 Kanaka huddled shivering in an empty parking lot, praying the Lahuli would answer the call. I will tell you about two nights spent caught sleeping directly under a sky scattered in stars, an air so clear every inhale is medicine. How every morning I woke to a Lahuli Kanaka growing as if we were watching Maui fish us one by one from the sea. Ask me. And I will tell you how on the third morning I watched this 30 became a hundred, then a hundred became a thousand, then a thousand became us all, each and every one of our kupunas standing beside us. Ask me, and I will recount their names, all 38 of kupuna who showed us mo'opuna how to stand, how I wept and wept and wept as I quietly held their names in my chest. Ask me, and I will sing the song of our monowahine, linked arms and unafraid, who stood in the face of a promise of sound cannons and mace, Ask me and I will tell you, I have been transformed here, but I won't have the words to quite explain, I will say. I don't know who we will be when this ends, but at the very least I'll know that this Aina did everything it could to be.
Sangha, what we'll be doing is really look at our past and uh, really talk about the ways in which our people have lived on this land, but also the way we've lived with each other and the way the land has inspired us to, to be a certain way, um, to love a certain way, to connect in certain ways. So this is a really amazing song, the one that we're about to do. It's, it's called Vaika, and it is a part, it's actually a modern version of an of an old chant called Hole Vaidea. The chant was composed by warriors of Kamehameha as they prepared for battle, uh, as they were stripping, uh, stripping spears, creating spears for their next battle um, in, in, the, in the mountains of Kohala, uh, in the hills of Kohala, in a place called Vaika. And what's amazing about this song is that it's a love song for their opponents. For, their, for the warriors that were that they were uh, meeting in battle, and and whom they might kill, and whom they might be killed by. It's it's not a song I could ever really explain, but Jamaica has explained it. Still, he has explained it. Extremely well. Okay, cool. So I, I think one of the ways that that we talk about this song today is that it reminds us how differently our kupuna, our ancestors, related to each other and how in many ways much more seriously and intimately they, they took issues of life and death. Uh, and one of the things we remember when we sing this song is that there's no there's no real Hawaiian word for enemy. The word we're taught is enemy, which is obviously a transliteration. Uh, but the closest word we have to enemy in Hawaiian is, is a phrase, hoa payo. And hoa is also the word for friend and companion. If I were to call someone my like beloved friend, I would say my hoa aloha, or my close friend would be my hoa pili. So hoa payo means a uh, friend or companion that you battle with or against, that you oppose. And so this song reminds us that in all things that our people did, that there was aloha, and that was reverent, there was reverence for life. And I think it's something we need to take seriously today. I think it's a lesson we learned again on Mauna Kea when battling with our Hoa Payo. And it's a lesson that many folks in the United States and in other um, colonial powers in the world really need to reckon with. Changing their orientation to things like power and opposition.
Look who your bunny went back there. Yeah. There she is. And um, now we're going to do a, an original song. There are a number of songs in this segment that are songs that um, Duncan has written, I've written, um, I've written with other people. This is... I helped write one of the songs. Jamaica has also written. <laughs> That's true. Well, Thanks. Most well, <laughs> prolific writer out of the three of us. <laughs> I write no songs. She probably wrote something in here. <laughs> Um, Jamaica has written an amazing amount of poetry, but we just can't seem to put any of it in the tune. So I don't know. We just let her talk, just talk over it. Doesn't seem to work. <laughs> <laughs> David wrote this amazing song. Come uh, on, wrote this amazing song a few years ago. A song called Midnight Stones. And uh, it's a song that as soon as we heard it, we knew we wanted to sing it with him. And, you know, knowing the way we are, we also wanted to steal it from him, but he's too clever for us. And he, he still has managed to hold on to the ownership of this song. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, one of the things that I love about this, this song is actually, I, I don't actually feel like I, I wrote it. This one kind of just happened. Um, and I remember it, it probably took me more time uh, to play this song start to finish than I did actually write it. Part of that is good. So a lot of these words from Kuna himself. <laughs> um, but it it just seems to become relevant in a lot of different scenarios. So it's good. Yeah. 
One of the things we wanted to share uh, with any of you who are tuning in is how much a part uh, we all are. Kalaka Maori here in the Pai Aina of Hawaii, how much a part we are of uh, the Pacific wide movement to care for this ocean, uh, to care for the islands uh, that are a part of this place. <laughs> known as Moana Nui That's a very Hawaiian thing you just did right there. Yeah, I did. <coughs> um, known as Moana Nui Akea. Um, known in other parts of the world as Juan Salvara. Back in 2014, we attended a conference in Papua New Guinea, and we celebrated with other artists the, the, the continued resilience and existence of native people throughout the Pacific. But we also were there to observe the fierce depredations on our land, on our self-reliance, on our own, um, on our on our own sovereignties in our own land, and how this had happened over hundreds and hundreds of years, and the way in which we were protesting uh, the fierce depredations of global capitalism, of waste and consumption of pollution, all of those kinds of things. We did this through our arts, through our poetry, through our songs, uh, through our visual arts. This is who we are as a people. We will continue to live so long as we can continue to see ourselves, even in this strange and changed world, um, and see through to the, to the future where we will be ourselves again, and our lands will be the same and our oceans will, will be restored, and our waters will be restored. The song is called One Salt Water. It is from the, the Melanesian word, One Salt Water, and it really refers to the fact that all of us are united by this great sea, by Moana Nui, by Oceania. <coughs> I, I think the song, in addition to, show, <coughs> to reminding us how we're, we're connected to the ocean, is also reminding us how these violences um, will impact all of us differently. And while we're we're currently undergoing this like vast human experience, right? A lot of people talk about this like unifying human experience of COVID-19 and this economic, what will most likely be this incredible economic depression that just because it's this huge human experience doesn't mean that we're all experiencing it in the same way. Uh, and in fact, that there are certain peoples who are exp experiencing heightened violence um, and have been experiencing these kinds of losses for generations in the same way that when we talk about the, the rising sea level, right? We could talk about climate change as something that will affect all of us, but it doesn't affect everyone equally. Um, and we need to pay really close attention to the ways that many people, poor people, brown people, women, queer people, people of the Pacific, indigenous people, have been vastly disproportionately impacted by these violences and have already lost um, Unmeasurable, I've already accounted for unmeasurable losses that we need to take seriously. Um, especially
especially when we come together around something like Earth Day, when we pay attention to the ways that we have harmed this Aina, uh, we should pay very close attention to how we've disproportionately harmed people who have lived on these Aina for generations. Uh, and I think this is a good song in paying attention to West Papua and those violences that can remind us of that as well. So this is our composition. This is our, this was our gift to the, uh, to the conference. Let me share it with you now. <coughs> Once I had a memory that was long once I had a garden, now it's gone. Once a what I believe your song. Once a what I. Once I caught a fish within my net. Once I knew what I should not forget. Once a you will lead us yet. Once a Once a our children will return their lives to me, the gracious sea. Once a Once I had a memory that was long. Once I saw the army sing. Once a we are not alone. Once a children will return their lives to thee, our gracious sea, once a Our next song is also a Pacific song. It's the Wananui, Wananui Akea song. And this is a song that uh, Jamaica, Liz, Soto. Liz Soto, and I wrote together to celebrate the life of the great poet, activist, professor, Tanisia Te'aiwa. The weeks when she was very, very ill and dying, we wrote this song and recorded it for her. It's it's a difficult song to sing because we we don't sing it very often, and it's it's only a song that is sung really for a special audience. And even though we can't see any of you, we don't know who is t is tuning in. We are treating you as a special audience to hear this and to hear this tribute to this remarkable person. Maybe the most important part of this tribute is that you recognize what we mean when we say 
that our people are descended from God. When you know a person like Teresia, you can see how true this is, because her life is like a deity. The gracefulness, the love, the compassion, the activity, the, 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 the sheer vitality of a life like this, something truly to celebrate, something that lifts us all and inspires us to be our best selves, that is truly godlike. And so we celebrate the Alma Kula. the horizon where the women see forever and the stories that their lives become spoken by the God. I have known you, Teresia, by your love for all your islands, and I sing your name with gladness for the goddess you become. Teresia by beckon us to search and to discover set your faith and joyful voice to sing your people's praise and they know you Teresia in a thousand ancient languages live long the Aumakua of the poet and the sage oh someone who loved Oceania, but who functioned like Oceania, um, yeah. and brought all these yeah. different islands of peoples together, and understanding the ways that we are connected. Um, 
and how for so many, every time I meet another Pacific or Oceanic feminist activist, like Teresio was such a lighthouse for them in the same way that Honani K. Trask has been such a lighthouse for Hawaiian women, Teresio continues to be this, um, you know, this beacon of light that, that Oceanic women continue to follow. Um, and live their lives in service to her, in service to the vision that she helped to fight for, um, which speaks well to the song we're about to sing because we're about to sing about another beacon mm -hmm. um, in another part of the Pacific. Um, yeah, the final song that we're going to do is a song that Randy Borden and I wrote for George Jarrett Helm and Kimo Mitchell. We wrote this in 1977 a few weeks after they, they left us, after they went to the Ao Aumakua in defense of the island of Kaho'olawe. What they did in dedicating their lives to that island and to its safety is something that we continue to call our own people to have to do over and over and over again. And it's, this is why, this is why when, whenever there is a protest of how land is being used in Hawaii, it is always led by Hawaiians. Um, we are the ones who have been the caretakers of this place. We are the ones who, who feel this in our own na'au. This is something that is in our very genealogy to do. And so, before we sing this song, we call attention today to, to everyone who's, who's paying attention, to everyone who is turning in, tuning in that we're about to go through yet one more, one more incarnation of that fight as we, um, as we have attempted now to protest and resist the, the coming of the, the huge naval convocation here, the RIMPAC exercises later on this summer. RIMPAC goes back to the days of Kaho'olawe and in fact after Kaho'olawe was, um, after concessions were made to people to protect that island so that it could not be bombed again with live ordnance, so it would not be used exclusively as a target practice island, it still maintained military position, possession of that island um, not only through the 19, uh, rest of the 1980s but into the 1990s and into the present as well. Um, RIMPAC exercises were held in 1988, 1990, and then 1992, in which live ordinance was used on those islands, on that island. And people came out to protest, people protested the gathering together of these powerful, um, powerful countries and their powerful militaries, and, 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 and wondering why they needed to practice here in the Hawaiian Islands on our people why there had to be a continual reminder of our weakness and our vulner vulnerability to them. And we are doing this again. Um, last, in 2018, um, 16 countries, 47 sur surface ships, a bunch of submarines, um, hundreds of aircraft, thousands of sailors and soldiers coming to the islands. And they are coming again even though uh, their presence here represents a real danger to us in ways that, that it didn't even represent before because of the virus. I, th I think an important, an important thing that that brings up in, in this COVID era is one of the things you said is that every time folks have protested the misuse of land um, and the harming of Aina in Hawaii, Hawaiians have led those movements. Those have all been made possible by our ability to gather. And one of the things we are unable to do in this time is to gather, um, to protect the, the health and well-being of others and ourselves and our kupuna. And so that means everyone's gonna have to step up from home to, to take a stand against these issues and not just stop RIMPAC 2020 because of the virus, but stop RIMPAC because it is harming our lands. It brings in all kinds of increased violence against women in our islands. Um, it, it speaks to the growing military powers around the world that cause all kinds of other problems in other countries. Um, and so I think 
you know, one of the things we talk about in this time is how we're, the narrative, right, is we're all in this together. Well, we're going to have to be in this in a more, we're going to have to demonstrate our commitment to our earth, our aina, our environment, and to each other in more aggressive and, and upfront ways because we cannot protest in the way that we have in the past. And it is scary the way that our states and our counties and our countries are growing even more unchecked military and police power. Um, and we're going to have to be able to organize some way that protects all of us and all of our land. Um, so I just wanted to add that. I'm glad you did. And, and, and it's, all, it's also important for people around the world to understand that the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, the, the movement for our people to have real independent control of our islands and our destiny is not removed it's not um, it's not incidental to the environment it is absolutely essential that we have this because we have not been able to completely protect our lands um, at any point in time in the modern era and it's time for people to recognize that we have not just the right to do this but the obligation here in the middle of the Pacific how we live how we live on these islands how we interact with the ocean, how we interact with others, has tremendous consequences for the rest of the world. We must be allowed to do this. I just have to remember how to start. Um. So this song is Hawaiian Soul, written in 1976. Um, they called off the search for George Helm and Keith Mitchell, who gave their lives in protection of Aina, that have been models that many Hawaiians have looked to and how to live our lives in service to our environment and to each other. I can
guys for joining us for this hour to joining us in our home, the home we grew up in, in Polo Valley on the island of Oahu. Um, I think at, at the root of all these songs is is a cry for us to pay attention to the way that our kukuna, our ancestors, really wanted to teach us that we needed to treat, that we learned love from our aina and from our environment, and we need to learn how to both take care of our aina and take care of each other better. Uh, so on this Earth Day, Earth Week, um, Earth eternity um, we hope we all take that call seriously and you go and start to, we all go and start to take better care of each other and the places that we are from and are living amen ahoy ho